Wimbledon has 92 trillion dollars. Um, that was the cricket we saw in those nightly horror movies of the winter of 1974-75. But this is a different story, the story of England's long high summer of 1975. There's never been a summer quite like it before, of course. 1947, was it as hot? No, I don't think it was. 1921, well, I was alive and it didn't feel quite so hot. Apart from a uh, rather sad backsliding on the 2nd of June, which we won't mention again, this was the perfect, long, blazing, burning summer. That gave it the setting. Certainly, BBC television sign, rain stopped, players never gathered so much dust through lack of use as it did then. The Prudential Cup set the tone for it. Eight nations engaged to compete for the championship of the world, though let us be fair and say that South Africa were barred from the competition. Now, in terms of arrangement, the eight countries were divided into two groups of four apiece to ensure for shrewd financial reasons that England had a certain path to the semi-final. Australia, West Indies and Pakistan had all to compete in Group B, but that did mean that from the start there were matches that really, seriously and urgently mattered. There was a capacity crowd at the first round to watch Australia with their team of fast bowlers who ruined England in the previous winter play Pakistan and Pakistan could be fancied to win with very reasonable fairness very strong side brilliant batting now Australia batted first and they made 278 a pretty useful total everyone wanted a sight of Jeff Thompson but his opening spell well even the first over was much less than perfect there were four no balls and a wide, all signalled officially by a phlegmatic Tom Spencer, derisively by the crowd and answered by Thompson with a signal all his own. But in fact, he never bowled more than the occasional good ball all day. So long as Maji Khan was batting and looking the casual master batsman he is, it seemed for a while that the large Pakistani element in the crowd would be lords in Leeds that night but Dennis Lilly's pace eventually was the decisive factor Sadiq was the first to go oh it's from Angus York and really let it go that's the fastest one he's bowled so far shattering the stumps right through Sadiq's defenses Good effort coming back for his seventh over, and that is the wicket the Australians needed. They're all going up. Lily's got another. Another catch for Rodney Marsh behind the end of Safraz pretty swiftly. That's in the air. Max Walker is coming around under it, and there could be trouble here. Walker has caught it. What a catch. And that is it. The last ball of Dennis Lilly's 12th over has ended this game. Now, after that, Pakistan had to beat West Indies to stay in the competition. They scored 266, and West Indies lost early wickets. But so long as Clive Lloyd remained, Pakistan couldn't relax. 17-year-old Javid Miandad is the bowler here and Clive Lloyd with 53 was looking ready to take the bowling apart and that's well bowled too and he's given him umpire language and Lloyd doesn't like it 
the Pakistan players absolutely delighted and that surely must be the end of things for the West Indies now with their captain dismissed for 53 goals now to Boyce bowl him and that is another inside edge onto the stumps Boyce not making full contact and the eighth wicket has gone down West Indies surely now cannot win that's been dispatched to the square leg boundary or behind square A very fine sweep by holder there hitting it right in the middle of the bat Pakistan leg spinner, me and dad, bowling to holder. Good firm stroke, just the single, and it brings up the 200. The West Indies are fighting hard here. 200 on the board for eight wickets, and this partnership has produced 34 runs between holder and Derek Murray. Safras to holder. Oh, what a great catch by Parvez Mir! And no wonder he looks pleased. He's playing in his first great international contest. And he may well have taken the catch to win the match. 32 to Murray, but it's Roberts now who has to face me and Dad. Good shot. Four runs. Slightly overpitched. Roberts might be going in at number 11, but he still doesn't waste an opportunity of that kind. And now it's Roberts to face Safras. A well bowled, very good leg cutter. 232 for nine. I see if bowls to Murray. A good shot, and that'll be four runs. I see pursuit to Murray. A great shot, and four runs. That's a lovely stroke from Derek Murray. Five runs from five deliveries, and it's no good the West Indies making 266, because in that case, Pakistan would win on the least number of wickets to fall. Wasim Raja. And he's got to hit the stumps. Oh, and he's missed running him out, and they'll take another run. Wasim Bari, the man who threw to Wasim Raja, he couldn't gather it in, and they took two runs. Three to win, and there are four balls left. Excitement certainly in the centre. As I hear the fieldsman, and almost overthrows there, so it is now 266. What a great job Andy Roberts has done in this over. The field has got to come in now and stop Roberts taking one more single. And there it is. It's the winning run for the West Indies. A great game of cricket and a marvellous win by the West Indians at one stage looking as though they were beaten. So Pakistan, who at full strength might have won it, were out of the cup. Now next came the most eagerly anticipated match of the competition. All tickets were sold weeks in advance for Australia against West Indies at the Oval. The ticket touts were in big business, while some people found even more illicit methods of entry. West Indian supporters had plenty to cheer about, plenty to make them confident when Australia were put out for a paltry 192. Now that never stretched the West Indian batting, but it was most gallantly done by Arvin Kalicharan in a splendid burst of defiance when he carried the attack to Dennis Lilly, as few batsmen in the world have ever done. And he's done it again. Four fours in four balls. Great shot. A beautiful back foot cover drive. The most talented batsman, Mr. DiPello. Lily again. Oh, 
a beautiful hit. Magnificent hit. Picked up from roundabout leg stump. And what an onslaught Pelicharan has launched on Lily here this afternoon. So Australia, runners up in Group B, went next to Headingley for the semi-final where they met England, who hadn't been extended in winning Blue Bay, but who now faced their first real test. Now it's Gary Gilmore, his second over of the day to Amos. Well bowled, and that's out! What a good delivery! And so Amos is gone for two, and England two for one. And he's bowled him. And Gilmore having a fantastic start here. And England's second wicket going down with a score on 11. And that's a brilliant catch, a beautiful catch by Marsh, taking it almost out of Ian Chappell's hands. So all three have fallen to Gilmore. Greg falling for the trap. The third wicket's down at 26. And Tony Gregg's out for seven. So Frank Hayes. He's out, no shot. Well, that's a sad way to go. A fourth wicket for Gary Gilmore. What a spell this man is having. And England are 33 for four. And poor Frank Hayes is gone for four. There's another one whipping through. And he's out. Keith Fletcher, LBW. Fifth wicket for Gary Gilmore. Five down for 35. for naught, 35 for six, and Gilmore's sixth wicket for 10 runs in a quite dramatic opening spell. That was a most accomplished piece of swing bowling, and England were all out for a mere 93. But John Snow, recalled to the side, also found the pitch and the atmosphere to his liking. Well bowled, good over this by John Snow. is out LBW for seven and Arnold has struck the first blow for England Australia 17 for one oh, what a good ball had no luck at all there John Snow is beaten all three batsmen on and outside the off stump and that must be close yes no doubt at all so John Snow taking the wicket he so fully deserved there, that of the Australian captain Ian Chappell, the second man out for Australia with a score on 24. Their best batsman following brother Ian into the pavilion. McCosco looking fairly solid at this point. And he bowled it! So this game really beginning to boil up now. Australia 32 for four. McCosco's gone. And the crowd, the jubilant crowd, think they might be in here for a thrilling finish. Old to Edwards. And he bowled it! Australia 32 for five and Edwards has gone without scoring what a game of cricket this is we're sold two for five now and the game thrown wide open and just look at those people Chris Old has taken three wickets in eight balls. 39 for six, Australia scores, stands it. It's a good, firm, solid blow there by Gilmore. No doubt about that one. That's not a chance there to Tony Gregg, a difficult one, but 
of the chances that really must be accepted. And hurrying through, Walter Scampering for the single. The single going to bring Australia victory here in the semi-final of this Prudential Cup. There was very little doubt about the man of the match award. So, Australia versus West Indies. The final at Lords. Perfect conditions, a full house, hardly daring to believe that this match would live up to the rank of World Cup final. Yet, but for that almost freakish last of his hand against Pakistan, West Indies would never have reached the final at all. In the wider aspect, the Prudential Cup was a magnificent success, the kind of success everybody had hoped, but nobody dared expect that it would be. Finance, entertainment, weather, everything was right, and it must happen again when the rulers of the game decide where. So the English season shifted to the Test Series with Australia. Mike Dennis appointed captain of England for the first test only. His major test won the toss and in a gamble with his career put Australia into bat on a slow easy wicket in good weather but with threat of rain. Australia made an utterly secure 359 and then the rain came and England were hurled out in what seemed just like a repeat of Australia 1974-75. Even there, Dennis Lilly had established something of a love-hate relationship with Dennis Amos. Lifted nothing he could do about it, short of a length, Amos has gone and Lilly has struck again. Fletcher now faces Walker. And that is out. Not a very good shot. And that's the second England wicket down with the total at 24. Walker to Edridge. And that's a good shot. Picked up and hit away behind square leg. The outfield is slow, but it'll still be four. Walker to Dennis. That's out and nicely caught by Greg Chappell at second slip. So Gooch facing Walker. Oh, and he's caught off a thin deflection down the leg side. He's right over the top, and Greg has hit him an enormous blow over long on. Oh, that's out. Must be out. England in a heap of trouble here. Tony Gregg caught behind by Rodney Marsh, the delighted Max Walker. Oh, what a fine ball. What a fine ball. Alan not hopelessly late on that. And that must be fairly close, yes, that's out. Error of judgment there by John Edrich. Oh, well bowled. My word, that's a nice piece of bowling from Lily. Underwood out, bowl Lily for ten. Oh, it's a good Yorker, indeed it is. I'm not at all sure that John Snow didn't get a touch to that. And he's under that, and it's safely caught. Greg Chappell is the man, ending the innings. 101, England all out. Dennis's gamble had failed. England followed on, and he personally needed a big score to retain his place in the captaincy. Oh, what a good delivery. A little bit slower, and it looked to me as though he deliberately bowled a quickish off-break. Certainly a slower ball. Mike Dines out for eight, bowled by Jeff Thompson. And I fear that that may be Mike Dines's last innings as captain of England. And it was. Mike Dines never lost determination or dignity. But even his friends, and perhaps indeed even Dines himself, must have been relieved when the stress of that increasingly impossible position was ended. For Lords, the new captain, Tony Gregg, promised team changes and a new approach. But with Lily rising above a sluggish pitch to bowl superbly, the beginning was all too depressingly the familiar story. Barry Wood was the first to go. 
Oh, that must be close. Yes, indeed. The first wicket for Australia, Barry Wood. That's well bowled. It reached the second wicket down. And he's given him out, and that's the third one to Bill Ali. And Amos has gone again for yet another naught, and Lily is a man who's done the damage. And that's it, caught behind. Little snake heard all over the ground here. Dennis Lilly claims his fourth victim. And England rocket to 49 for four, with Gooch caught by Marsh with his score on six. That was the undramatic David Steele's dramatic cue at the age of 33 to become a national symbol of England's resistance. It's a good shot. Off the mark, four runs. Oh, fine shot. What a great shot there by Danny Steele. That's the way to play the bouncer. Let's see what retort we shall get from D. Lilly after that. Well played to Mr. Way Square on the offside. Ball running away down this fast outfield, and that's four more. driving it on the up to four square on the offside. Uh, Steel facing Lily. Hits him beautifully off the back foot for four runs down the hill on a very fast outfield. The hundred up. Lily again to Steel. He hooks in for four, and the crowd really enjoying this. Lily dispatched for four, a bad ball. Lily again to Greg. Pushes that away through the open space in front of Square, and I think he's got enough run on it for four. And there's a big gap. Half volley beautifully driven by Greg. Ross Edwards a long, long chaser and the ball gathering pace the whole time through for four more. And that's flicked away to deep long leg. Greg will be looking for the second. He's hurrying, he's coming back and there he comes. Great long legs bringing him through to a really excellent 50. He really has taken some of this Australian bowling by the scruff of the neck. He's got through to 50 in only 86 minutes when England were in a lot of trouble. David Steele on the 49. And David Steele going through to his 50, hammering that off the back foot, through to mid-wicket. And what a great performance this has been from David Steele of Northamptonshire. The cricketer's choice, really, for a place in this test side. And how well he's merited his inclusion battled against adversity from the moment he came in and he's made 50 out of 143 for four. He's bowled him. So Thompson breaking through, beating David Steele there with that extra little bit of pace. Pleased about that, a bad ball from Mullock. Dropped very, very short and Alan not confidently off the mark. Good shot. There's no man there at mid on. It's rather a strange looking field. Rather not. He's picked the gap nicely. And that outfield is very fast. Very steady. 
Then the 50 partnership comes up. And another very good one for England. Great straight. 200 up for England now. And what a good performance, having been 49 for four. Tony Gregg, Alan Mott, and later Bob Warmer sustained that resistance. England reached 315, summing at last for their bowlers to attack. Jon Snow characteristically took this chance to make us all wonder why he was ever dropped from the England team. Here, he bowls to McCosker. So Jon Snow has caught the outside edge there two or three times. And Bill Alley in action again. Up goes the finger, and the Turner is out. LBW to Snow for nine. That's well bowled. Might just have pulled the bat away. Breakthrough so desperately wanted by John Snow and Tony Gregg, and look at the England team now rushing to congratulate Snow. A great spell of bowling. That will bowl to and he's got him out, LBW. John Snow, his third wicket, Australia, 37 for three. And no wonder England looked delighted. As English amazement merged into elation, Australia were reduced to 82 for 8 when Dennis Lilly joined Ross Edwards. It's a good hit, a big hit, right over into the crowd. First six of the match. A good shot. I word that was a good stroke from Ross Edwards. Good shot again. Very strong off the back foot. And the glorious square cut by Edwards. It's a shot brought him so many runs. It's a way to go through the 90s. Moves on then to 95. Only one slip. Another five men able to save one. And he's out LBW. Oh dear, what a disaster for Russ Edwards. But he's held the fort there for 201 minutes. He's never looked in any bother at all until his score was on 99. It's a splendid stroke off the back foot. Stroke of a real batsman. Oh, that's a splendid shot. That's an even better one. What a great shot from Dennis Lilly. A magnificent six, hooked away, over square leg. A really great stroke. Great shot again to give him his 50. Levers being severely dealt with out there. He had eight taken from his first over of this spell. And now Dennis Lilly has assaulted him again in this over and has moved to his own half century. And that swung high into the crowd. It's a big six by Dennis Lilly. Having. And that's how LBW and David Steele has done it. In his first over, broken up this very stubborn last wicket partnership. And Tony Gregg absolutely delighted there. England's lead 47. And they set about increasing it. Here, Walker bowls to Barry Wood. It's a good shot. 
He was over that very nicely, played it down through the gap and it raced away. That's a good shot and that's four runs. It's a good shot, no mid on of course, you have to chase those. Murray Wood in no hurry, quite confident it's going for four on his right. It's in the air, but uh, safe and will beat Turner out on the boundary. That's his half century. Good comeback for Barry Wood. gone a good catch that the first wicket down at 111 Barry Wood out for 52 Ashley Mullet with his off spinners from the pavilion end it's a fine shot it's more like short still really putting it away with a lot of power through the offside it's been four hours for John Edrich for his 62 and yes he's got one through that will skid away through for four Sweep and four runs. Four runs. That's a good stroke. He gave himself a little bit of room there. It's a more militant approach from John Edridge. This is going to be his 100, I'm sure. Yes, he's running back for the second. And he's home. So John Edwards has got 100 for England. Instead of Thompson or Walker, it's going to be Doug Waters. And he's done it again. He's broken the partnership. Now, what a tremendous ploy from Ian Chappell. He's pulled Walters in, the great partnership breaker in Australian cricket. He's bowled David Steele a full toss and taken a brilliant diving catch away to his right. And that's another good shot. Really fine form being shown here this morning by John Edwards, clipping that through mid wicket. Both bowlers coming alike to him at the moment. Bowling again to Amos. And that's it, he's caught him in the slips. It's the old, old story, I'm afraid, that Dennis Lilly has dismissed Dennis Amos once again. And that's through the slips. Quite well intended it, but it's going to bring four runs to John Edwards. That's four runs. And he moved to double figures for the first time in the test innings. Good shot, four runs. And that's a beautiful stroke. Two extra cover. Edwards hoping himself a little bit, that will go through again for four. Even Gilmore, no chance of cutting it off once it beats the field down there towards the top. So the 300 coming up, 303 now for three. With Edrich moving the score under 146. Mullet to Gooch. He's bowled him. So Graham Gooch, the fourth man out for England, he made 31 and enjoyed a partnership of 56 with John Edrich. Good full swing of the bat. First ball from Greg gets him off the mark. Four runs. That's six. What a great shot. It went over Greg Chappell's head, but it went a long, long way over. Oh, that was a lovely stroke. Good shot. 
Put that up nicely. Well wide of Jeff Thompson. Greg already down the wicket. He's caught, driven very firmly and very solidly. And Doug Walters at short extra, clinging on to a very stinging drive there. in the air, could be out and it's the end of John Edwich and appreciation then for the Surrey captain John Edwich a marathon stay at the innings the man who's really put England in this exceedingly strong position he's out for 175 and occupied the crease for 9 hours Took a change there Little dive and it slip. Uh, they scramble through the hundred. Four hundred up then. Four hundred for six to England. And there's the old streaker. He's going to be greeted when he gets back. Probably picking up a ten-pound note from somebody. And Bob Rule must turn this time. He's swung it away. He's hit it gloriously. Right into the crowd for six. And that one has gone for six, a very, very big hit. Into the tavern bar. Woolmer here taking toll of Ashley Mallet. He's moved on to 31. And there he goes. Third time and the wicket to Ashley Mallet. And that's it. There's the declaration. Tony Gregg, the England captain, on the balcony, beckoning the boys in. That declaration left Australia an improbable 484 to win in 500 minutes. In the event, rain shortened the last day and made the match a draw. But now England, in a quite amazing metamorphosis, had achieved fresh spirit, fresh resistance, fresh heart. And just as surely as the captaincy brought the best out of Greg, so he had brought the best out of his players. And David Steele, the North Hants unknown of a week before had become almost an English folk hero. So it meant that headingly ahead was now an opportunity and no longer a potential ordeal. Now, reflecting the new feeling, Edrich Steele Gregg led the batting and England finished with 288. That hardly seemed a commanding total until Yet another of the new players realised the selector's best hopes, or better. Under the new qualification rules, Phil Edmonds, who was born in Zambia, was only lately qualified for England. Young, quick-witted, he's an attacking slow bowler. Here, Ian Chappell is the batsman. And that coming on with the arm. No spin there this time. Worst ball is bowl in his second over. Oh, would you believe it? A great start then for Phil Edmonds. So, Ross Edwards taking guard, his runner in the customary position just by the square leg umpire. And that must be it. Yes, LBW first ball, and Phil Edmonds is on a hat trick in his first test match. So the hat-trick ball coming in, Walter's facing. Quick one. So Doug Walters survives. And that's it, and he's caught him. Swept straight into Derek Underwood's hands behind square, and Greg Chappell goes, really off the middle of the bat. So what a fairy tale start for Phil Edmonds. Slip by Chris Old. Doug Walters down the far end. He's on 19, 107 for 7, Australia. And he's given him out LBW. And five wickets to Phil Edmonds in his first test match. 
everything had gone right for Edmonds and indeed for England. With a lead of 153, their second innings was dominated yet again by David Steele, who, unfussily and professionally sound, followed his first innings of 73 with a 92, which only disappointed all England because he didn't reach the century everyone felt he'd earned. There's a good stroke from David Steele. Oh, it's a genuine half volley. Firmly hit through mid off. Thompson chasing it, giving it away. It's beaten Gilmore this time, much to the relief of David Steele, because that single takes him through to yet another 50. Steele, a fine shot, using his feet beautifully down the pitch, and it's into the crowd. A great six then by David Steele. Placed again by Steele. Nicely timed shot off the back foot. So just beating McCosca through there. And Steele, that's another fine shot. Really good control, quick by square leg there by David Steele. That's a fine shot. First time he's really been able to time the hook off Jeff Thompson, got in the position nicely. That's out. So still not to make his hundred, and the crowd here hardly realised what had happened. It was such a snappy catch there by Vetchup at midwicket. There was silence here of a few seconds until they saw David Steele head bowed a little on his way back to the pavilion after another really excellent effort. Out for 92, caught by Greg Chuff at midwicket off the bowling of Gary Gilmore. Steele had given England the chance to square the series. Australia were left needing 445 to win, more than any side had ever made in a fourth innings to win a test match. But at the end of the fourth day, Australia, at 220 for three, needed another 225 runs, or England just seven wickets, to decide the match. We left the ground on that fourth evening, anticipating a great final day. But we woke up to the news that overnight the pitch had been vandalised as a demonstration by friends of a man they believed to be unjustly imprisoned for armed robbery. In the event it had no real effect on the match because rain would have prevented play for most of the day in any case. So we came to the last test with an extra sixth day allowed since although Australia had retained the ashes, England could still square the series. Once more, the wicket was deadly slow. And when Ian Chappell, as captain of Australia for a record 30th, as he said, last time, won his first toss of the series, they battled. Chappell and Rick McCosker, calmly and scientifically, reduced the English program to pack. Delightful little cut. Beaten second slip, giving him no chance of cutting it off. Skating through for four more. That's beautifully put away. Now we're chasing it, it's going to be in vain, running through for four. Well, that's got away all right. Now we can cut it all the way for four. Very good shot. It wasn't all that far away from leg stump. Oh, a lovely shot. No need to chase that. That's a great strike. That's probably McCosker's best shot of the day, I would think. It's a good shot for four runs. That takes McCosker on to 99. It's his highest test score in England. It's 
great shot. What a way to make your first test century a glorious hook shot. Getting it all the way past square leg. A splendid performance by Rick McCosker, his first hundred in test cricket. And there it is. Two runs to Ian Chappell to bring up his century, take him on to 101. A very good innings from the Australian captain. When Ian Chappell declared at a towering 532 for nine, England were caught on the one grey overcast swing bowler's day of the match. Walker in particular bowled superbly, and England were out for an abject 191. 341 behind, and when they followed on, with almost three full days left, their position seemed hopeless. It was then that Greg's English team reached its peak of achievement, with the kind of resistance the side of 1974-75 in Australia had never mustered against the Australian fast bowlers. One after another, they did their jobs. John Edridge, all grit and hard edges, made 96. David Steele is now familiar phlegmatic self, 66. Graham Roop coming in on the brink of disaster and after a duck in the first innings, 77. Alan Knott, gamely defiant as ever, 66. And to cap it all, Bob Woolmer, treated by his county as a bowler who can bat a bit, with the slowest century ever recorded in England-Australia tests, saved this one against all probability. England had justified themselves, even though Australia, by taking the first test match at Edgbaston, had retained the ashes. The thought still nags, though, if when Dines won the toss at Edgbaston, he'd given England first innings and Australia had batted on that rain-damaged wicket, how might that match have gone then? And, from that point, how might the series have gone? England could count her access of confidence as an immense gain, but couldn't afford to forget that much of this was achieved on pitches so desperately slow as to reduce the effectiveness of the Australian fast bowlers by at least 50% by comparison with the conditions in Australia less than a year earlier. Still, though, in addition to the splendid captaincy, the uplifting captaincy of Greg, England could count as a gain the return of Barry Wood, a very game batsman against Pace, and the entry of Steele, Woolmer, and Edmonds. All these are positive gains, and they make for a stronger England side. That's not to say England are going to dominate world cricket, certainly not against sides as strong as those currently appearing for Australia and West Indies. And one must remember that the sharpest edge of the England attack was John Snow, rising 34, which is an advanced age for a fast bowler. This, though, is advance. Let us not demand more for that, and let us look with hope for the young players coming up to test standard through the county game. In those domestic competitions, Leicestershire, the team built by Mike Turner and captained by Ray Ellingworth, were technically, tactically and temperamentally outstanding. They won the Benson and Hedges Cup and at the end they became county champions for the first time in their history. In the Gillette Cup, Lancashire staged a semi-final repeat against Gloucestershire of that 1971 classic in the dark, even down to the fact that once again David Hughes was there when it mattered. Roger Knight to David Hughes. David Hughes realising he's got to do something about it. He struck it magnificently over the top. And is David Hughes going to do it again? That was a tremendous shot. Used his feet, kept his cool, kept his head down, and put it into the crowd over the top of mid-off. Electric atmosphere, that's the quieter section of the crowd. But uh, down amongst the young boys, by the screen, difficult to hear so speak. That's picked up again, it's another great blow. Brown now to Simmons. 
Not to hurry. If it hits, he's struggling. He hit the wicket. They want ten to win. There are nine balls left. Field moving in. That's it. Ratcliffe has done it. The crowd came in. He's driven it straight back. Extra cover. He's leaping in the air. Absolutely delighted. So once again, Lancashire, with their custom built and experienced over limit team, were in the final. Middlesex unexpected runners up in both one day finals. The game without gun. Darley Dale was the unlikely setting for Hampshire to take the John Player Lee. And as so often, their opening batsman, the South African Barry Richards and West Indian Gordon Greenwich, created a winning position for them. My word, what a splendid flow. Six over cover point. I must wish he could go away. Another six. 24 off his first two overs, six off the first ball of the third. Made the great, great bat move just a bit. Played it well, that's his first boundary. That's gone a long way up, it's coming a long way down, it's got a lot of carry and it's six again. Looks like six. Richard Gilliatt happily accepted Hampshire's first one day trophy. The 1975 season also saw the retirement of some of cricket's most respected players. Graham McKenzie of Leicestershire, Western Australia and Australia. Splendid athlete and most courteous of fast bowlers. Oh. Oh. McKenzie, look at him. It's not often you see McKenzie get excited. But really left in the air, the crowd on their feet. A sad blow there for Hampshire, the great Richards, clean bowl by McKenzie with a very useful ball indeed. MJK Smith, Mike Smith, prolific batsman, respected and well-liked captain of Warwickshire in England. It's a lovely shot by Smith. Picked the line of that very quickly. John Murray played his last match at Lord's in the Gillette Cup final, saluted by those who knew him best on his own ground. And he later demonstrated why he retired with the world record for wicket-keeping dismissals. Oh, what a great catch! What a marvellous catch by J.T. Murray. In this, his last appearance at Lord's. Frank Hayes caught Murray, bowled Gomes for 17. And you will struggle to find a greater catch than that in this summer or any other summer. Some other very worthy cricketers left the scene this summer too, including Tony Nicholson, that master medium pace scene bowler of Yorkshire. And you may wonder why I haven't mentioned Colin Cowdery. Well, although he's announced his retirement, I cannot believe he's going. I cannot believe he's going to leave the game he loves so deeply and which satisfies him more than anything else after a season in which he scored a century against the Australians. And less than a year after he was summoned to Australia to play in a test match. If, in five years' time from now, he hasn't played again, I'll say goodbye to him with every bit as much sincerity and admiration as I could do now. Among those who stay in the game, it's important that the cricketers themselves, voting from the dressing rooms, picked as their cricketer of the year, Peter Lee, that dogged, plug-away, seam-upper of Lancashire, who doesn't get much publicity, but can still take a hundred wickets in the season. 
one notices North Hants and their potential despite their captaincy difficulties. One remembers that Robin Hobbs, in what he subsequently called his last season, took a remarkably fast hundred off the Australians, who persisted with their slow bowlers, and he continued to go down the pitch and hit them out of sight. It was a season of immense exuberance and of quite immense fun. It was a season when, in absolutely the right social setting for the first time in English history, there were Indians, Pakistanis, West Indians, Australians, New Zealanders, Africans, Sri Lankans here to cheer on their own sides in an international competition. The sun shone and when the sun shines, people will always come to see cricket, especially when it's as entertaining as so much of it was this season. Well, no end to stories about cricket and no greater storyteller than John Arlott.